Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. I want to ask you this morning to kind of look back to the, your childhood years. I won't make you stay there very long. But I want you to think back and think about the um, area of discipline, how your parents disciplined you. And, you know, some of you, that's like not really fond of memories and that kind of went in a bad direction. And some of you, you know, you have somewhat more positive feelings about it. There's just a variety of feelings and emotions that we might have when we think about how our earthly fathers discipline us. For example, like in your home, who was the disciplinarian? You know, was it mom or was it dad? Were you like me where if you really messed up, mom would say, go to your room and wait for your dad to come home, which was like a sentence to death row. Like you're just waiting. It's like you hear the gallows being built outside the cell window. You're waiting, and you're waiting. The waiting's worse than anything that your dad might possibly do. But like, like that, that was it. Or, or and maybe mom was a little easier to kind of manipulate, charm your way around whatever you did. Like one, one was kind of easy. One was kind of hard. Was that your experience? Like you know, who was it? And what about in your home? Like, you know, those of you moms and dads, like, do your kids view one of you as kind of the stricter, more disciplinarian, and and, and the other one a little softer? Like, which is it? But going back and thinking about your mom and dad, like, you know, know, was it always clear why? Like, if you were in trouble and there was some consequence being meted out, like, was it clear to you? Like, did you understand why? Did they help you connect the dots? Hey, you're in trouble and it's because of this. Or you're in trouble, and or, or or maybe it's just that. Hey, we're trying to help develop this this character in you. We're trying to help develop, and so we're gonna, you know, enforce this kind of discipline or this kind of rule. You know, was it clear? Did they did they connect the dots? And if it if they didn't, what was that like? Was it just confusing? Did it feel like, man, just kind of out of the blue, all of a sudden I'm in trouble? Like, you know, was it unpredictable? Was it surprising? Or how, how did your parents discipline you? You know, like depending on your age, the discipline strategies probably change. And, but, you know, sometimes when you, you think about parenting, you think about discipline, you can think about this, this, this scale that, you know, uh, that has kind of the idea of, of real love and relationship building and affirmation and all these positive relational things. And on the other end is this kind of idea of rules and discipline and consequences for wrongdoing. And, you know, both of these things are kind of really important. Like you, you, It'd be nice if our parents walked perfectly in balance with those things, but your parents weren't perfect, my parents weren't perfect, and we aren't perfect as parents. And so what happens is you tend to kind of drift to one of those sides, right? And so like maybe your your parents really drifted or your dad drifted to the side where, um, I mean, I just really want you to know that I love you. And so I've kind of, you know, not going to ever correct you. In fact, what I really want to do is show you how cool I am. I want to be your friend. And they were real permissive. And there wasn't much discipline. Or maybe your dad or whoever was a, the, the, the disciplinarian really drifted to the other side and said, man, listen, there's right and wrong, and we're going to get this right, and man, there's going to be a lot of consequences. And they were really strong in this area, but there wasn't much love. There wasn't a lot of affirmation. There wasn't a lot of tenderness, just really a lot of toughness. And maybe you had one that kind of you know, went to one of those signs. Maybe a dad was absent. And so you had a, a single mom who was doing the very best she can, peddling as hard as she could, working two jobs. And as a result, you just kind of were by yourself a lot. I mean, she's working just to kind of put food on the table, and you get home from school, and maybe you were one of those uh, you know, latchkey kids, and, and you had to just come home and and as you grew up and got older, you realized you could pretty much do whatever you wanted because no other one was around and no one was going to really discipline you in that sense. And looking back on it right now, you're thinking, man, I wish I would have had more discipline. I wish I would have had more discipline. I might not have gotten in with that crowd. I may not have made those choices. 
if I just had some more discipline in my life. Maybe dad was absent. Or in one of the worst scenarios, what if dad was abusive? And so, you know, there was never this controlled spanking. It was physical abuse. And so when I talk about discipline, you have the very worst memories that you're still recovering from. And so when we come to a passage like this morning that's going to talk about God, our Father who disciplines us, that as soon as you hear that, that all of us tend to grab all of our past recollections, uh, memories, feelings, whether bad or positive, and we bring that into this passage, and we can hardly imagine a God who would discipline us any differently than the way that our parents did. Because you see, one of the questions when you think back about your childhood was that, did you cooperate with the discipline? Or did you primarily look back, did you, were, were you provoking power struggles all the time with your parents? Or when they did discipline, when they did bring in consequence, did you receive it? Did you listen to their voice? Did you respond to it? Did it have a positive impact on your life? Which is basically the question that I want you to think about right now. As we get ready to go into this passage that talks about Father's discipline, are you ready to hear His voice? Or because of this topic, You've already shut him down. In fact, maybe right now you're thinking about getting up. This man, I don't want to talk about. I don't want to hear this. This is a topic that you may feel like is very heavy. In the way I've approached it, it does feel heavy. But I want you to know that what God does with us in the way of discipline, it's not like the bad memories that you have. There's something very good and holy and righteous, something that we should be very appreciative for. So I want to pray for us again, and then I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to look at this area. And and the challenge to us is, do you dare to be disciplined? Do you dare to be disciplined? Father, as we begin, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would speak to us, teach us, that your truth would take root in our heart, just as Isaiah prayed earlier. Uh, Lord, we acknowledge to you out loud together as a family of believers that we need your Holy Spirit to give us insight, help us understand truth accurately, and then to apply it. Lord, give us faith and courage to apply your word. And so, uh, Lord, we come as your children. We come as your sons and daughters under your loving hand. Lord, help us understand Uh, the role of discipline, Lord, in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, one word of definition before we go forward. Obviously, sometimes we use the word discipline in the sense of, uh, you know, like your spiritual disciplines, having a quiet time, prayer, hey, you know, bring some discipline in your life, like exercise. We don't want to talk about that. Uh, That kind of discipline. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of discipline that is more corrective in nature, uh, not, not punitive, as you'll see, but more formative that God does in our life. So having said that, uh, we, we want to look at three things. First of all, like what's the role of discipline? And then what's our response to discipline? And finally, like what's the result uh, that God has in mind with discipline? So that's what we'll do first. And in the uh, first part of our passage here, uh, talking about this role of discipline, that what we're going to do is talk about how discipline is actually the proof of God's love. It's the proof that you're in the family. Watch how this unfolds. Uh, We finish up from the last week's verse, um, last week's passage in verse 4, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Um, In verse 5, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Now he's going to quote from Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. He says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves 
and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But He disciplines us for our good, that we may share His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Why don't we pause right there for a moment. And you can see, as uh, we read through there, that one of the things that you draw immediately, somewhat obviously, is the mere fact that, that God disciplines is the very proof that we belong to him, that we're part of his family. Uh, you know, uh, uh, God disciplines us because we belong to him. If I'm walking down the mall and, uh, um, you know, I see you know, a, a child acting out, I'm not going to walk over them and, uh, you know, discipline them. They don't belong to me. I, you know, I might say something if, it's, if they're in destructive mode, but, but I'm not going to like discipline them like I would my own child. In fact, the children that I discipline are because they belong to me. And one of the things that he says here is that, look, discipline isn't the sign of rejection, that God would bring pain in your life, something unpleasant, is it to say that God is rejecting you? It's rather that God is affirming you, that you belong to him. Now, he makes a comment here about like all of us endure discipline. And he says that the illegitimate um, sons, they're the ones who basically have kind of like forfeited their desire to be like part of of who God's going to reward in the kingdom. I'll show you that later in the passage, but he's going to give the uh, uh, example of Esau, who was a son of Isaac, but, but nevertheless sold his birthright. It basically said like, okay, I, I'm a child, like I belong to you, but all the fullness of the inheritance that would come, like I'm, I'm not going after that. Uh, it would be Isaac that that blessing would pass through, that would go through. In other words, there are those who are all disciplined by the Father, but the ones who are moving forward, like they're the ones that God will continue to discipline. Those who don't move forward, as we've learned elsewhere in chapter 6 and chapter 10, sometimes God just like, if you're not moving forward, like God may just remove you. But in this passage, he's talking about all of us moving forward and God working on us and our character and, and, and what eventually I'll call just our spiritual formation. As we continue here, notice that uh, not only is discipline the proof of the Father's love, the proof of family, but it's also this idea of progression in formation. Progression in formation. Now, this is really important. This is uh, also applicable for our own children and in just in the area of parenting. But in the sense of spiritual parenting is that God's discipline is not punitive. It doesn't look back and say, okay, I'm going to try to like get at you. It's formative. It's moving forward. It's trying to help form Christ-likeness in our life. He says that, um, like, for they disciplines for a short time, but he disciplines us for our good, verse 10, that we may share his holiness. Like his purpose is to try to help mold us and make us like Jesus. That's what I mean by it's not punitive, but it's formative. You might also say it's not punitive, but sometimes it's corrective. If God finds us moving in a wrong direction, if something is, uh, is out, of, out of alignment with his priorities, that he may try to move us back on track, that's part of discipline as well. Discipline was used in a number of different ways, like um, you know James chapter 1. Let me show it to you. It just talks about how God uses trials to really shape us and build our faith. Uh, look at that. Most of you know that passage. Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Those trials, those things that what Peter calls in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, he says, he says don't be surprised, brothers, when you, come, when you fall into that, that fiery trial. Um, 
you know, don't, don't let that surprise you as if something strange has happened. That God uses these things as part of his discipline in spiritually forming us. As we come back to the passage, we see here this spiritual formation. We see it kind of pictured, like what, what is God trying to form in us? He says, therefore, verse 12, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may be not be put out of joint, but rather it be healed. In other words, what he's saying here is strengthen yourself to receive whatever discipline that God is bringing into your life. Like, don't back out of it. Don't, like, just kind of crumble apart. He says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. This is the, the, the formation that God wants to bring into our life. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears." Now, there's a lot in that passage, more than what we can get at at this point in time. But I think from a high level, what I want you to get out of this is that God basically, the reason why he disciplines us is that we might live up to his family values. That's kind of our first big uh, point today, big principle, that those who are, would dare to be disciplined live out the family values. You're part of God's family. Discipline affirms you belong to him. And what is he trying to do uh, when God disciplines us? He's trying to get us to live within his family values. A righteous living, holy living, loving relationships, purity, uh, uh, that we're living with a real sense of purpose in mind, that we have this inheritance to share that we don't want to forfeit. Like all these, these are the things that kind of mark the family. So uh, that's, that's what we want to get at. Uh, God uses different experiences to help us in that. Uh, Kathy had an experience Sunday, uh, Friday night. So we were at the theater, we were at the movie, and the uh, movie hadn't really started yet. We had a, a full you know, diet, a Coke Zero, a lot of ice. It's full of the top. And, you know, it sits there and the chair is between you. And I reached for it, and I merely felt it was starting to slip out of my hand. And so I, I, I wanted to, you know, I didn't want it to slip out of my hand, so I squeezed it. <laughs> and, and, and the cook started, blew the top off of it, and, and then, before you knew it, the whole thing had emptied into her lap. <laughs> And she jumped up, and she just jumped up, and, you know, there's people in the theater. <laughs> and I'm saying, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, do we need to go home? Do we? And I'm trying to, you know, and it's quite a trial for her. <laughs> and so she could have said, hmm, I wonder, like, have I done something wrong, and is this some kind of consequence? <laughs> uh, is God trying to teach me how do you love a man who disappoints you? <laughs> It's a trial. And, you know, we left. We exchanged tickets for the next showing. She changed. We reconciled. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes, as we're going to see in our next point, is that, you know, this, this is the idea that God is at work. And sometimes, you know, you, you look at funny things like that. But there's times when, that, that are hard. You know, there, there's times when... You know, things just from a mild hassle, you get a return check. Check bounces. And you think, well, man, this is such a hassle, and it's so bad, and it's kind of embarrassing. But then you think, okay, God maybe is saying, you know what? When are you going to take some time and really get your finances under control? When are you going to actually take some time and develop biblical stewardship in your life? Or, you know, more seriously, like, you get pulled over, you get a DUI. And God is saying, do you think 
alcohol is getting too much control in your life? Could be you're in high school, young adult, whatever, where there's a relationship that has become so important to you. In fact, you have attached your emotional well-being to that relationship. And she or he breaks it off. And all of a sudden, that which you were depending on goes away and you're, you're left thinking, okay, God, have I started looking to other people and things for life instead of you? And sometimes God brings into that moment an opportunity for us to refix our dependence completely on him. That those possessions and people he brings into our life can be real blessings, but they're secondary blessings at best. But when we make them primary blessings, they become idols in our life. And God, because he loves us, because he wants the best for us, takes us through times that we might call discipline trials, where he strips away from us those idols that are robbing us of the very life that we want. That can be the case. That's an example of discipline. C.S. Lewis said this, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but show, but shouts, in our pain, it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Sometimes it's in the midst of some kind of suffering or pain where God is trying to realign us with him. That's discipline. It has love as its motive. Okay, the role of discipline then is that we would live out the family values. The second thing is we come back to the passage so I want to talk about, well, how do we respond in discipline? And, and basically, the big idea here, is, before I start reading, is that if you're going to uh, respond to the, uh, uh, God's discipline for the family values, you've got to listen to his voice. You've got to listen to the Father's voice. And in the next section of Scripture, the writer of Hebrews does something real interesting. He's going to talk about the Father's voice. And he's going to talk, first of all, about... Uh, the Father's voice that came out from Mount Sinai, um, where the Old Covenant, the, the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments were given. And he's going to contrast that with the New Covenant. And in fact, let me just kind of read this, and then we'll, we'll build a chart here together, contrasting these two ideas. You'll notice, first of all, verse 18, I've highlighted this in yellow. For you have now come, I'm sorry, for you have not come to what may be touched, in a moment, he's going to, uh, when we jump down to verse 22, he says, but you have come, all right, so there's a, there's a place where you haven't come, there's a place that you have come. The place that you haven't come, he, he goes on and says, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now, if you write down Exodus 19, and you, later you can go back and read in Exodus 19, this is the very scene where God is speaking and he's calling the people up close to the mountain, so that they can hear God speaking to uh, Moses and thus believe that this is God really speaking. And uh, it, it's a pretty uh, descriptive display of God's power and awe, and the people are intimidated by it. And then uh, he goes on, he says, in contrast, verse 2, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Mount Zion would be Jerusalem. You know, and, and it's the place issuing the new covenant. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels of, in a festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You think, what in the world is that? 
speaks of better blood than the blood of Abel. Okay, well, let me, let me just try to contrast this a little bit more for you. So I want you to see that, uh, that the, in this contrast, you've got, first of all, the voice from Sinai. Okay, the Father's voice at the giving of the Ten Commandments. And you've got the voice from Zion. And the voice from Sinai is where the Old Covenant was established, or the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, uh, which happens in chapter 20 of Exodus. Chapter 19 describes the, the, the scene that we just read here. And then under the voice from Zion is the New Covenant, obviously, as, as we just read. From the voice from Sinai basically brought fear. It brought fear and distance. It didn't draw you near as the New Covenant does. Uh, one brought fear, one brought you near to God, as we've been learning in the book of Hebrews, where they've been contrasting the new covenant as the better covenant over the old covenant. The old covenant uh, really highlighted guilt. The old covenant established, here are the holy standards of God that you have to live up to, which none of us were able to live up to. The nation of Israel never could live up to the holy standards. And so there was this sense of guilt and shortcoming all the time. Whereas the new covenant really was the emphasis about grace. First of all, that in God's grace that he provided forgiveness for the fact that we couldn't live up to his standards. But then with the new covenant, God gave us a new provision, the Holy Spirit. And that new provision actually provided for us the power that the Old Testament believer didn't have to obey God. The Holy Spirit stirs us up our desire and strength to obey God. And then finally, the Old Covenant, voice from Sinai, was really one of judgment. In other words, because you're failing, there's going to be these judgments to, to, to follow. Whereas with the New Covenant, what was there was uh, justification, that you've been declared righteous. Now that's kind of what's going on with this blood of Abel. You remember the story, uh, Genesis 4, Cain and Abel, uh, Cain, uh, kills his brother Abel, who had made a righteous sacrifice to God. And we're told that the blood of Abel cried out against Cain, cried out for justice. That's what the blood of Abel does. It says, guilt, justice is needed. But the blood of Jesus, the blood that's better than the blood of Abel, said, justice has been satisfied what theologians call propitiation. That the righteous judgment of God towards sinful man has been met by Jesus Christ on the cross. And the blood of Jesus not only fulfilled the demand for justice, but brought forgiveness. That's the new covenant. And so in other words, when you talk about listening to the voice of the Father, are you listening to the voice through the old covenant? Or are you listening to the voice of God through the new covenant? And that's kind of the second idea here, is that if, you're dare to be dis if you dare to be disciplined, you'll live out the family values and you'll listen to the Father's voice. You'll listen uh, to the Father's voice. Like that's kind of um, you know, the idea here. Uh, the question application-wise is, are, are you listening? Do you listen to what the Father's voice is saying to you? Uh, when our kids were growing up, um, we, we had a memorize, or at least I know one in particular, we had, we had memorized this proverb, Proverbs 12.1. I won't tell you which one, because they sometimes listen to these messages, and far be it from me to you know, give them a bad name, though. Okay, Proverbs 12.1, look at it. It says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. And so, all of us need to hear that. If God is speaking to us, and whenever he brings discipline in our life, he's always got a goal in mind. that spiritual formation, sometimes spiritual correction. But if you say, man, I don't have any desire to want to hear his voice, the scriptures, not me, the scriptures would call you stupid. Proverbs 13, 1, one chapter later, says, A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. And one of the challenges to us today is that do we maintain an openness to hear the Father's voice, to hear what He is saying um, to us? This week I, uh, I lost my phone, and 
<clears throat> I couldn't figure out what I did with it. Like I got home Wednesday night late and um, was looking for it, couldn't find it, you know, checking all my clothes and, and uh, went out in my truck, searched all through my truck, couldn't find it. And I figured, well, maybe I left it at uh, this place I'd stopped for dinner. And uh, I came back uh, the next day, got late enough. I called the restaurant, restaurant, you know, there no sign of it. I couldn't believe it. I said, come on, man. It didn't look. I'm kind of pressing. I'm like, no, nope, no. Nope. And then I go into this four-hour meeting with uh, our staff. And we're doing some worship planning. And I'm mentioning, like, yeah, I lost my phone. And I, I don't know what I'm going to do because I, I can't figure out what it is. And I, that Wednesday night, I had been teaching at uh, Saturate Austin Institute over at Hill Country Austin. And so I called over there, and, and they checked, you know, the platform and, the, you know, everywhere I'd been, no sign on my phone. And so I'm starting to think, like, well, um, what am I going to do? Because, like, I'm going to have to spend the money to replace a phone. But what about all my information? And the staff started saying, well, you know, you got this thing about Find My Phone app. And I didn't, wasn't really familiar with that. I didn't know if I had it on or not. But they find out, like, they try to get into my, I, my Google account. I didn't know I had a Google account. <laughs> They're texting Kathy. Kathy's giving them passwords and stuff. And they, they find that they, they do this whole investigative search and they find my, my phone. Um, but it's, it doesn't show where it is because it's, I guess, dead or off. And, and it was a uh, false, it was dead end. And so, you know, all this is going on. And I'm just kind of, you know, I'm starting to worry a little bit about like what, how much trouble this is going to be. And Rachel says, well, um, maybe I'll just check your truck one more time. She goes out to my truck and turn, comes back in about five minutes carrying my phone. <laughs> Made me feel real foolish. And I thought during that time, I said, God, what are, you, what, what are you doing? So what's the lesson here for me? Like, you know, what, what's the voice? Am I getting too attached to material things like my phone? You know, like, did I do something wrong? Like, I, is this payback? And I thought, no, that's the old covenant voice. You know, like, am I, is this just the silly consequence of, like, you're 61 and you can't remember where you put things. <laughs> like, what's going on? And I know it feels like kind of a silly idea, but like, are you trained? Are you trained to like ask, like, God, what are you up to? What's the Father's voice? Is there something He's trying to say to you? Can you think of a time? Can you think of a time in your last 12 months, last two years, last three years where Something has happened in your life, and you're thinking, man, God is speaking to me. God's trying to get my attention about this. And did you respond? Did it bear fruit? You know, because God loves you, he's trying to form you. One of the things that we love to say is that, you know, God loves you just where you are. But he loves you so much, he doesn't want to leave you there. God wants to move you forward. God loves you just where you are and commits himself to you for the rest of eternity if you place your trust in Christ. And then he's going to work with you to help you move forward. That's what it means to listen to the Father's voice. It's to ask and to learn what uh, he's doing. I have people sometimes come in for marriage counseling and very rarely does the man say, hey, Danny, I'm just here because I just want to be a better husband. I just want to love my wife better. Very rarely does a woman say, Danny, I just, want to, I just want to learn how to love my husband better. You know what they're saying. They're saying, look, Danny, like, my wife's not loving me the way she should, and I want you to fix her. Now, sometimes they don't say that word as directly, but that's what they're saying. She's going, you know, you know, Danny, my husband's really letting me down. Can you fix him? And that people are primarily looking for that. Do you know when pain comes into your life, the temptation is to focus exclusively on relief as opposed to formation? Moving forward, how, how, how God might use this in one of three ways that I like to use a lot, like that God's trying to increase your intimacy with God or He's trying to deepen your dependence on God or He's trying to help you develop a richer reflection of God. Very rarely are we asking those questions. 
most of the time, we just want relief. And when God doesn't cooperate with that, we get so upset with him. We're, we're, we're really upset. But God is saying, listen, I love you. I want to form Christ-likeness in your life. And there'll be times when I will assign or allow pain in your life that is designed to build into you increased intimacy with me. How many times is your little son or daughter, when they're hurt, come into your lap and throw their arms around you. Increased intimacy. How many times have you ever felt like, you know, that you're growing in the depth of dependence on God? I mean, we read this idea out of the Lord's Prayer about, you know, give us this day our daily bread, and you can't even relate to that. You know, you've got a full week of groceries in your pantry. Some of you have a whole month. Like there's no sense of dependence on God. But then things can change. And you find yourselves like with very little. And then depending on God becomes a whole new experience. Some of you have experienced that. Deeper dependence, a richer reflection. In other words, that your life reflects to the world a contagious love for Jesus. But there are things, impurities, or inconsistencies in your life that God's trying to root out of your life. He's trying to bring the fire to raise the impurities to scrape them off so that you might more richly reflect them to the world. That's what God does. And we must listen to the Father's voice and cooperate with Him. That's what He's up to. Finally, uh, we need to look at this last one, which is what I'm calling the result of discipline. And uh, uh, let me pick up again with verse 25. It says, see that no one refuse him who is speaking. I, you know, don't, listen, don't fail to uh, hear the Father's voice. See to it, to it that no one refuses him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Now, you may have gotten lost in there, but what he's basically saying is that the day is coming when God's going to renovate this world. He's quoting out of... Um, uh, Haggai chapter two. And he says, "Look, th th this this pleasant this present place, like God's going to shake it, and He's going to replace it. He's going to renovate it. Uh, there is a kingdom coming, and then afterwards a new uh, new heavens and new earth. And He's trying to get us to like watch for the kingdom and worship the King. That's that's kind of His idea here. He says, look, He's going to renovate this present world." And he wants us to faithfully participate or prepare for the world to come. He says, uh, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Well, if this world can be shaken, what's coming cannot be shaken. It's his eternal kingdom. And he's telling us, remember, we're living for eternal things, not the things that can be shaken in this world. Like an iPhone. He's saying, look, live for things of eternal nature. Now, we have seen this over and over and over again in the book of Hebrews. In fact, if you've got your Bible open, just look ahead in chapter 13. Look at verse 14. It says, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. That sounds just like Hebrews chapter 11. And so as we come back to this passage, he says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And this let us offer to God accountable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. All right, so let's remember who God is. Let's, uh, as we're watching for the coming of the kingdom, let's, let's worship the king. There's gratitude about our future, and there is this ongoing worship and faithfulness right now. Uh, the discipline looked to the future vision. 
The discipline, if you dare to be disciplined, you're looking to the future vision. And what I mean by that simply is this, is that good parenting begins with the end in mind. Uh, wise parents begin with the end in mind. In other words, if you think your child's going to graduate out of your home at 18, <laughs> so you wish, supposedly your your son or daughter moves out of your home at 18, what does he or she need to know, be, and do, be able to do? And so you begin with the end in mind, like what is it character-wise? What what do we need to build in his or her life for that? He's got a future vision, your dad, your mom. And what we're learning here is that God has a future vision for you. He's got an experience he wants you to have that earlier in Hebrews was called the rest, Uh, Later, just referred to as reward, a responsibility in this coming kingdom. He's got this future vision for us. And the more we focus on that, the more we live faithfully now. The more we watch the kingdom, the more we will worship the king. C.S. Lewis said, It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become uh, ineffective in this one. I want to ask you to pray with me, get our worship team to come out. Uh, Lord, um, I pray that you would give us courage and faith to open our hearts and our ears to hear from you, Lord. What is it that you're doing with us? That, Lord, right now, many of us may be in a season of just blessing. Like, Lord, you're just blessing us, like our relationships, our finances, our health. Lord, everything is going so well, and though we don't try to fix our happiness on that alone, we just give you thanks for for the joy of of great circumstances. But Lord, for some of us, we're facing some hardships, and I pray that you would give us ears to hear, Lord, is there something that you're saying to us, that we would routinely ask, what does faith look like here? God, what are you up to in this situation? How are you trying to spiritually form me and conform me to Christ? You know, God, is there something corrective here that I need to give attention to? And Lord, may you, through that, just continue to grow us in your family values as we listen to your voice. And Lord, as we anticipate your vision for our future, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.